Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this webinar series in the CUJH Consortium of Universities for Global Health webinar series. Our topic today is on the subject of diagnostics are essential for healthcare, challenges and LMICs and how to overcome them. My name is Quentin Eichbaum. I'm a professor of pathology, microbiology and immunology and also medical education at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. I am very happy to be introducing what is our first session on the topic of pathology and diagnostics in global health. During the CUJH conference earlier this year, we were very glad to have a panel on this topic, and we also spoke at several satellite sessions, and we're also able to introduce the Lancet series on pathology and lab medicine. So this all goes to show that pathology is gaining the due recognition it needs in global healthcare delivery. And our session today is in line with that endeavor to help people in global health think more clearly about the essential role of pathology and diagnostics in global health. So we have today as speakers myself, and I will first introduce the topic as to why I think pathology and global health are essential components and links in global health care delivery. When I'm done, I will hand over to Dr. Dan Milner, who will introduce himself. He is the Chief Medical Officer of the American Society for Clinical Pathology, and he will be speaking on the topic of uh, pathology diagnosis, the center of cancer management, no matter where you are. And when he's done, he will be handing over to Dr. Kevin Karim, who is at the CDC, and he will be talking about CDC laboratory systems, pathology, and diagnostic role in global health. Please, as we go along, Send your questions through to the uh, organizers of the webinar, and we will have time at the end for uh, answering those questions. So I am now going to go ahead and talk on my topic of what I call pathology, the missing link in global healthcare delivery. Um, let me just get this moving. Oops, I'm having a problem moving my slides. Uh, there we go. So let's, uh, first topic is in the, uh, an essential book, Global, The Global Burden of Disease, written by uh, Chris Murray. He has a statement, it is difficult to deliver effective and high quality care to patients without knowing their diagnosis. To pathologists, that seems quite obvious, but to many treating physicians, there's been a bit of a gap and the essential role of having accurate and timely diagnosis has been much underappreciated. And on the right, you see a copy of the Lancet publication that came out earlier this year that drew attention to this issue in low and middle income countries. And I'd strongly encourage you to read that. It's available online as it accentuates the critical importance of having accurate and timely diagnosis in global health. Next slide. So when we look at pathology in uh, LMICs, we'll see a wide range of labs and healthcare centers. On the left, you may have rural labs, which are, have a very limited testing menu and uh, often not the best quality controlled conditions. And yet in some other centers, and, and I work mostly in Africa, so that's what I'll be referring to a lot, as in Johannesburg, for instance, you'll see very well-equipped laboratories. But let's take a step back and look at the vital link that uh, pathology and diagnostics serve in healthcare in a healthcare delivery system. What is generally appreciated is diagnosis. You've got to get the right diagnosis for the right patient at the right time. But pathology and diagnostics serve a much uh, broader role and less appreciated role in, in the healthcare delivery system. And there underneath you see there are pathologies involved in disease staging and prognosis, ongoing assessment to support clinical care, secondly in monitoring clinical response to treatment, disease surveillance, for instance, with disease registries, and then absolutely and critically laboratory uh, quality assurance within the healthcare system. 
Now, in LMICs, we've often associated them with uh, mostly infectious diseases and pathology, and labs have been involved in uh, HIV, TB, malaria. But as the graph on the right shows, um, as people are living longer, the, there's been a, a great increase in the number of, of NCDs. And across the world, not in, not in Africa, but generally with age lowering in infectious diseases. But if you look at the graph on the right, you'll see the differences um, in different uh, uh, countries and uh, areas of the world. The, the bar graph on the far right shows high-income countries, middle-income, low- and middle-income, and low-income. And if you look at LMICs, low-middle-income, you'll see the green shows communicable diseases and the red section of the bar shows non-communicable diseases. The point there is the pathology is involved not only in infectious diseases, but increasingly in low middle income countries, also in uh, uh, NCDs. A study done by Ann Nelson and uh, Dan Milner showed in Africa the incredible undercapacitation of pathologists. And you can see in green, South Africa is pretty well capacitated, but as you look at the graph, the uh, Countries in yellow and red are severely undercapacitated, and the numbers are given on the right. If you look at a country like Chad, I've underlined there's only two pathologists, Niger, two pathologists, and they are serving millions of people. So we have an enormous undercapacitation. The number that's been touted is an undercapacitation of about 27,000 pathologists in Africa. So when I think about pathology, I think there's something quite unique about pathology as a, as a medical specialty that people often don't understand, and that is that it is completely dependent in many ways on, an, un, on another underlying discipline, and those are the clinical and anatomical laboratories. And if those are not operating optimally and with absolutely an excellent quality assurance, we have a problem, because what this leads to then is that physicians cannot trust the the lab value that they see or the slide they see, and that leads as the World Bank in a study in 2014 said, clinicians can lose confidence in laboratory services and resort to presumptive diagnoses rather than laboratory information. And that backfires because in return, laboratory staff can become demotivated by a lack of faith in their pro profession. And so the World Bank drew up this chart of the vicious cycle of the uh, laboratory as a profession, if you go through it, it's the production of the lab staff is modest. In green, you have insufficient numbers and low-level qualifications, poor career structures coming around clockwise, inadequate work environments. And then what I've circled there is clinicians lose confidence in laboratory services and use presumptive diagnosis. Now, that is absolutely critical in low resource settings because if you're not sure what you're treating and you treat anything uh, just pay, based on a presumptive diagnosis, you will uh, be treating the wrong thing, and that's extremely wasteful. So the effect of inadequate pathology diagnostic services in low resource settings has a domino effect. If you have miss or underdiagnosis leads to inadequate treatment referral, inadequate referral leads to inadequate follow-up, Treatment delays lead to poorer clinical outcomes. You have suboptimal, wasteful use of limited resources in low resource settings. You have inadequate reporting of disease rates, incidence, prevalence, mortality, and that absolutely limits the ability to plan for medical care needs in low resource settings. This is the critical link that pathology serves in, the, in these settings. So in view of that, the Maputo Declaration in 2008 um, set about trying to strengthen laboratory systems, and you can read that there and see it online. I'll just read the underlined sections. They called on uh, governments to support lab services as a priority, to provide strategic laboratory plans and integrate lab support for major centers, um, training, recruitment, retention of lab workers, to produce one unified integrated national laboratory network and elevate the efforts to develop new diagnostic tools. So in view of that, we also have, certainly in Africa, where my, ex my experience lies, uh, groups like SLIMTA and SLIPTA uh, for laboratory management, for accreditation, and for quality improvement towards accreditation. And these groups are doing a good job towards uh, laboratory strengthening on the continent. So there are 
two other <coughs> measures we might think about in improving the effectiveness of diagnostic testing. The one is creating perhaps an essential diagnostics list rather than doing everything um, everywhere. And the second one I want to talk about briefly is tiered laboratory testing. And so if we look at the first one was an attempt led by uh, Tim Amokele, the model for essential diagnostics, they basically linked the essential medicines list of 300 medicines with lab tests um, and created a list of 147 tests sorted into 57 categories. And if you look in the table on the right, you'll see how they categorized um, the different kind of uh, essential medicine categories with a particular test in the column on the left. What that does, and it's been a, uh, accepted by the WHO, it gives us a sense of maybe what are the most uh, important laboratory tests we should be thinking of, and it allows us to uh, monitor, also monitor medication effic efficacy and toxicity, etc. The second initiative is um, one that has been reported in the Lancet series, um, and that is to have a tiered approach to laboratory testing. Rather than doing all tests everywhere, you have, if you look at the below, tier one, which is primarily rural healthcare centers serving mostly health outpatients. Tier two would be district hospitals, tier three provincial and regional hospitals, and at the top, tier four. And as you look at the arrows pointing upwards, the level and num amount of testing and complexity increases as you go from uh, tier one to tier four. And so from the Lancet series, you'll see here, um, several people have, have had different versions of this. I'm showing just tiers one and two. You can see on the left tier one, the kinds of testing which we might consider doing in a rural hospital. Certainly point of care testing and slide microscopy and some FNACs. If you go to tier two, you have somewhat more complex clinical biochemistry, more hematology tests, cultures in microbiology, and higher level of anatomical pathology testing. And then there's tiers three and four. What the tiered approach actually does and aims to do is to have an integrated network of labs working across these different tiers with clinicians in a country. And the advantage of it is, is that you have testing appropriate to geographic and healthcare contexts. It's less costly than attempting to do the full menu of testing everywhere, easier to maintain fewer quality standards and less equipment, and it's overall has a more effective for healthcare delivery within a country. So that's a move that is being thought about quite carefully in numerous uh, low and middle income country contexts. I want to sort of, as I come to an end here, just touch upon point of care testing as the solution, the Lancet document also talks about this, that we need to be a little cautious about this because it is certainly easier to perform and interpret and communicate often, but the unplanned and uncoordinated growth of point of care testing to the detriment of controlling health and improving outcomes is something we should be cautious of at the same time. So the effectiveness criteria for point of care testing should be that number one, the test must provide results for uh, specific clinical problem to guide clinical decisions in the time frame for monitoring disease status and response to therapy. It should establish performance criteria. And number three, it should be affordable and usable and stable. And number uh, four, should, um, we should meet procurement requirements for supply chain uh, maintenance and availability of quality control standards, durability, and climate stability. So my point here is that we need to have point of care testing, but we also need to be cautious about it and not review it as the panacea for everything. So if we strengthen our laboratories and are careful and judicious about how we go about point of care testing, the World Bank talks about having a virtuous cycle and you can read through that. You have you know, training services are strengthened, clear career paths, larger pool of qualified lab workers. They're motivated and then in green you see the confidence in laboratory services is restored. So I just accentuate this because we could train pathologists forever, but if the labs are not properly functioning and we still are resorting to presumptive diagnosis, we have a problem. So my take on messages are basically that diagnostics and pathology are, are critical and that inaccurate diagnosis leads to waste and higher costs downstream, which we cannot afford in low resource settings. The pathology number two is 
critical for the healthcare system and it links the right diagnosis, right person, right time with effective treatment outcomes. And then sustainability of diagnostic services depends on, again, effective lab systems. We need much more training, education, accreditation systems, quality standards. We need absolutely buy-in from ministries of health, lab information systems, and reimbursement. So we have a long way to go with all of this, but that's by way of overview of where we stand in the diagnostics uh, field in low- and middle-income countries, and I thank you for your attention. My contact information is there. Please type in your questions, and I'm now going to hand this over to uh, Dr. Dan Milner from the ASCP, who will briefly introduce himself. Thank you so much, Quentin, and thanks everyone for joining us today. My name is Dan Milner, and I'm the Chief Medical Officer of the American Society for Clinical Pathology. Quentin gave us an excellent introduction to the challenge of laboratories in LMICs, and, to, and for my brief part of this webinar, I'm going to focus on one disease, cancer, and how pathology, or pathologists, as Quentin was alluding to, are really crucial, and the pathology lab is crucial uh, to management of cancer, no matter where you are in the world. First, let's look at the magnitude of cancer as a problem in, uh, in LMICs. So in this slide, we see that cervical cancer disparities in mortality, which is a preventable disease, are quite striking from the United States, where the incidence is 2.4 per 100,000, to places like Uganda, Tanzania, Malawi, and Swaziland, where it ranges from 44 to 75 per 100,000. That's rate of invasive cancer. Why is that rate so low in the U.S.? Screening. Why is the rate so, low, so high in Africa? Lack of screening. But it's also important to remember in the lower left that mortality from this disease is extremely high as well. So here are two vectors that we can focus on to create public health programs, reducing the incidence, total incidence, and also reducing the mortality from invasive disease. The good news is that HPV DNA testing has been added to the WHO Essential Diagnostics list that Quentin just referred to, which is one step closer to getting this disease solved. But this is what I really want you to think about. Between 2015 and 2035, we will lose $21.3 trillion to NCDs, noncommunicable diseases, which include cancer, heart disease, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and hypertension, in LMICs. That means that and from an economist's point of view, it doesn't matter how much we invest, we're going to get an ROI. With a trillion dollar investment in NCDs and LMICs, we get a 20-fold return. So there's really no economic argument to not improving pathology services and cancer services and NCD services overall in LMICs because we're just going to earn our money back 20-fold. At a high level, when people such as ministers of health or government officials or even NGOs are thinking about cancer, these are the three spheres that they often talk about, prevention, screening, and diagnosis. Prevention will prevent 30% of cancers when it's done perfectly. And we don't do prevention perfectly, but if we did, we could get rid of 30% of cancers. If we screened perfectly, we could get rid of another 30% of cancers. So that leaves us with 40% of all those in cancers that are out there now that we would still need to be able to diagnose using tissue pathology, for example, to take care of those patients with cancer. But today's world in LMICs finds very little prevention effort and very little screening effort so that most patients, if not all patients who have cancer in an LMIC must have a diagnostic test. So improving the public health care system by creating prevention and screening strategies will reduce that overall burden of disease, but the uptake on that will take years. And so today, we need diagnostics in Africa to take care of cancer. From a clinical or medical point of view, most people would think about cancer in these four pieces of a puzzle. We need a diagnosis, and then we're going to do some kind of surgery and chemotherapy, and then perhaps we would use radiation therapy depending on the cancer. Um, but that puzzle is much more complicated than that. And if we look at it from the point of view of reality, we have many, many different pieces in cancer care, um, many of which have nothing to do with the laboratory or surgery, sometimes nothing to do with the patient themselves, but are rather things like support services or radiology, et cetera. And as Quentin alluded to, some of these things need to be centralized or in a central laboratory 
at a highest tier, but many of these services need to be duplicated at every level of the healthcare system. And so the puzzle becomes very complicated. But if we take that puzzle and look at it from a different point of view, of a patient journey point of view, when we put lots of money into education, we can have prevention and we can have screening, and many patients will be prevented from ever having cancer, and many patients will be screened and have something called early detection care, for example, removing a polyp from the colon or doing a cervical leap or loop, which cures them of that risk for cancer. And so they technically don't ever develop cancer. So that's that early detection care paradigm. But if you have screening and you're found to have a cancer, or if you have a symptomatic presentation, or you have a late stage presentation, you need a diagnosis in order to tell you what treatment you need with your clinician. And unfortunately, today in LMICs, most patients are on the left-hand side of this under symptomatic or late-stage presentations, and thus diagnostics are crucial. But diagnostics as a bubble, just like all of these bubbles, are complicated. This is the exchange that has to happen in anatomic pathology when a biopsy is taken from a patient to prove they have cancer. Note that there's constant interaction between the pathologist and the clinician who takes the biopsy, and constant interaction between the pathologist and the individual who will be treating that patient. This requires const that constant communication, but also an understanding of a system of referrals, as well as quality, processes, turnaround time, et cetera. If any one of these pieces are missing, the system does not function. If any one of these pieces are massively understaffed, the system will lag or suffer. So the next couple of slides are gonna show you very quickly sources of delay in pathology value chain and the solutions that are out there for those, those delays. And I'm not gonna go through them in the detail. The slides will be available after this talk, after the webinar, but I just want you to get a feel for the fact that there are problems with patient presentation because patients don't know what cancer is, so they don't know to go to the doctor, but education and public awareness can improve patients' acumen about their own bodies and get them there. Similar issues arise with clinicians and things like biopsy tools. Having the resources needed to actually take a biopsy from a patient are really crucial, and you can provide those as if you make them essential tools and do the training. Specimen transportation, something a lot of people don't think about. You can't take a piece of tissue from a person with a suspected cancer in a rural village and just carry it in a little plastic baggie for a week and a half to a central laboratory. It has to be put in a very specific fluid, usually formalin, to be preserved, and it needs to get to that laboratory relatively quickly. So specimen transport networks um, and how referral networks work are part of the whole process of cancer care where pathology is, is, requires that it be in place. When we get to personnel, we can have poorly trained individuals or management issues, which can be fixed with on-site training, but sometimes we have no pathologist, and I'll talk about that in detail in just a moment. Similar problems with reagents and supplies, standardization of those reagents, and delays in procurement, all of which have solutions. We just need to be able to enact them. And then there's the reporting process, going back to that communication figure that I just showed you, where we really need to have resources that can electronically send information back and forth between clinicians and pathologists so the patient is having a very rapid turnaround time um, with a standardized report uh, that allows for the clinician to treat them using a protocol uh, which is accepted by, for example, the NCCN guideline. As Clinton alluded to earlier, though, having no pathologist is a major problem in Africa, uh, which is where many LMICs are located. If you look at this graph, which is slightly older than the picture that Quentin showed you, but shows you the same data, you see that the ratio in many of these countries is from one to 200,000 up to one to five million. And ratios in the UK or the US are more like one to 15,000 or one to 20,000. So there's, a, as Quentin pointed out, a huge deficit in pathologists, but it would take many, many, many years to train enough pathologists to be able to cover the services. And so we really need to think about innovative ways to put, to, to put more pathologists on the ground. When we think about pathology laboratories, especially for cancer, we do site assessments to understand what they need. And sometimes this is simple. A site says, we really need to treat patients for cancer, but we don't have a laboratory. Well, then you need to build a laboratory and all the components that go with it. 
But sometimes you have a pathologist and they don't have a laboratory because of a natural disaster or a fire like in Haiti or Nigeria uh, that have recently happened. But you can then, you know then that you have the person there to do the work, you just have to build a lab for them. So those first two situations really require building that lab. However, the next three situations where you have a lab but no pathologist, or you have an understaffing of pathologists, or you, your, your lab has pathologists but they're just not meeting the standard of care, have different solutions that can help, including visiting pathologists, which are not sustainable, but also telepathology, which is the ability to support a pathologist virtually from a faraway distance so that they can have more rapid and accurate diagnosis as well as rapid turnaround time. And then lastly, when a site has sufficient staff and meets the standard of care in a laboratory, you must harp on them as a model for other labs so that there are nearby neighbors and super users that can help people improve their own laboratories. Let's look at telepathology really briefly. Telepathology has a couple of different approaches. One is static image. One pathologist takes a photograph of a patient's histology slide and, and emails it to another pathologist and gets a consultation. This is not a terrible system, especially if you have a low resource setting, but it really does require MD to MD for maximum quality so that the person looking at the slide on the one end knows what they're looking at and what they have a question about, and the person on the other end um, also knows what they're looking for and can comment in the same language and vernacular. But we can move to systems like dynamic image or whole slide image where the entire slide in its entirety can be sent to a pathologist and that image can be captured by a technician, so no pathologist is necessarily needed. Eventually, that laboratory must have a pathologist to have sustainability, but for the time being, if there's a shortage, you can have a, a laboratory without a pathologist that can be supported by these two types of telepathology. Lastly, there's something called automated histology, which is essentially a computer reviewing a histology slide and giving some information back to a user who may be overwhelmed with cases so that they can make decisions faster. And this is sort of the area of artificial intelligence, and many companies are interested in this, but these technologies are far too expensive and too premature for helping us in Africa today. So the Partners for Cancer Diagnosis and Treatment in Africa initiative, which ASCP initiated in 2015, uses telepathology along with upgrading laboratory services to create or leapfrog laboratories to a place where they can get rapid diagnoses for their patients. The approach is to use crowdsourcing where our anatomic pathology members sit at their desks in the United States on teams of 15 people connected to laboratories in places like Tanzania, Uganda, Malawi, or Ethiopia, um, and have instant access to up to 15 pathologists to consult with them on how to make a diagnosis. We tend to um, organize these around academic centers because academic centers in the U.S. have, have some built up um, reputation and infrastructure in these countries, and so working through them, we can more rapidly deploy the systems. But at the end of the day, any pathologist who's an ASCP member in the U.S. can volunteer and read as few or as many slides as they like. So our program uh, for telepathology has five active sites currently, three labs in Rwanda and two labs in Tanzania. And just as an example in Rwanda, before the laboratory um, was originally installed in 2012, the turnaround time for a patient was about six months. Um, that's too long because the stage can change, the, 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 the diagnosis may be invalid, et cetera, et cetera. In Rwanda now, in one site where there is telepathology plus a pathologist on the ground, whole slide imaging, and immunohistochemistry, the turnaround time has been reduced to less than 72 hours. So a patient can show up on Monday and by Friday they can start their chemotherapy. This is equivalent to what would happen in the United States. And so that type of progress can be made with simple tools like telepathology and immunohistochemistry when cancer is taken seriously and wants to be treated by a country. We have five more countries that we will be deploying telepathology to um, in 10 sites, and we use a whole slide imaging system, as I described in the telepathology slide, um, and those systems sort of beam the images to the U.S., where teams of 15 ASCP members per country review them and can help uh, pathologists get a diagnosis very quickly. 
We also are launching in October 2018 um, uh, anatomic pathology laboratory information systems, which are available to all of those sites, which allow for accessioning, processing, and reporting of tissue samples um, in a rapid, controlled way with external quality assurance. So this hits on two or three of the points that Quentin was making about improving laboratory quality, improving laboratory services, et cetera, and we're doing that free of charge for these sites using software provided by a third party. Um, the hardware that's being provided are things like barcode readers and barcode printers so that the, the laboratories can actually move through rapidly and keep up with their systems. And again, it allows for anonymous monitoring of data and measuring of impact. So when we combine the telepathology piece with this anatomic pathology lab information piece, we've now plugged into a laboratory the ability to more rapidly and accurately make diagnoses um, and done so with very little investment on the part of the local provider. But what's required for this to work is that that local provider in the LMIC has taken cancer seriously from the treatment side and has looked at the WHO essential medicines list and is procuring those medicines and is ready to treat patients and then plugging in the diagnostics will allow you to make that progress. So briefly, just wanted to say thank you to a lot of our partners, including uh, Zyphon and Motic, who are helping us with our current activities, as well as the remainder that are listed here who are participants or funding our work. And with that, I will conclude um, and remind you to please, um, to please uh, li li give any questions you have to the moderators and then I'm going to turn it over to Kevin from the CDC. Uh, hello, my name is Kevin Karam, and I'm with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, and I'm the Associate Director for Laboratory Science Center for Global Health. Uh, and I want to add to what uh, Dan and Quentin have talked about in terms of laboratory systems and the importance of pathology and quality management, but more in the context of lab systems uh, related to our global health program here at the CDC. So briefly, the history of CDC, uh, in 1942, Communicable Disease Center was established here in Atlanta. Uh, and a big part of this was predominantly control of malaria through the, the spread of mosquitoes and figuring out ways to manage those types of outbreaks and epidemics. Uh, and as uh, related to somewhat to what we've been talking about, what Dan and Quentin have mentioned, some of the biggest challenges were through uh, establishment of systems to have quality and equipment uh, to develop these programs, geographically important uh, sites for control of mosquitoes and therefore control of malaria in the southern U.S. So uh, as most of you know, the, the threat of global infectious disease has grown as air travel has increased in the last 20 to 30 years. Uh, and, and this continues to be uh, a situation associated with many outbreaks that, that we and other agencies around the world deal with. In 2017, the, the, this map represents in purple countries that reported outbreaks uh, through our global disease detection um, systems here at the CDC. And you can see it is truly a global problem in terms of infectious disease outbreaks. Our laboratories uh, are very broad uh, and our mission is really uh, to protect Americans 24 seven. We have over 1700 scientists and over 200 labs that we're associated with uh, to help with this mission. So uh, I, this slide is really to emphasize, uh, a lot of people talk about lab capacity and if you're not in the business, it's hard to get an idea of, of what that means. And so when we work with other US government agencies, we can look at uh, the number of laboratory operations or technical support for clinical pathology or laboratory operations globally. Uh, and so these red arrows represent the CDC's global, uh, Center for Global Health specific global disease detection sites. Uh, some of these are outdated, these are, are changing, uh, but there are roughly 10 of those globally now. And then the PEPFAR program that focuses on HIV prevention, uh, prevention mother to child transmission and test and treat scenarios uh, has been a, a magnificent example of, of program implementation to save lives globally, uh, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, 
The uh, Department of Defense has a surveillance program called GAIS, which is also global and overlaps significantly with other efforts. And we work closely with them on surveillance capacity. And then the influenza program uh, through our National Center uh, of Infectious and, and Respiratory Diseases, Influenza and Respiratory Diseases, works closely with the World Health Organization on global sites for flu surveillance. And then the President's Malaria Initiative covers pretty broad reaching areas and specifically focuses on malaria components. And this map is an example of the capacity that we have globally from the US government. Uh, but one of the deficiencies we've seen in some sites is the lack of coordinated effort between these particular programmatic laboratory activities, including pathology. So a big part of our emphasis at CDC around laboratory science has been focused on has been focused on the global health securities agenda. Uh, and this is in alignment with the WHO's International Health Regulations, or IHR. I'm sorry, this is advancing. Um, the priorities are, are shared among these initiatives. Uh, laboratory support, surveillance, workforce development, and emergency operations. And these are areas that we at CDC have focused on particularly uh, to strengthen laboratory activities for some of the same features that, that Dan and Quentin talked about, and that is quality management and activities related to standardization and support. Uh, these slides, I, I, I borrow the next couple slides from Joel Montgomery, who runs our, uh, ran our Global Disease Detection Program. And I love these slides because it really looks at an epi curve and breaks down specific areas uh, for detection and response. And this example, we're looking at a, a distribution, a fairly broad distri distribution between first case report and, and response. And in this scenario, the detection and reporting, and then there's a larger gap uh, between, for example, day eight and day 18 for lab confirmation, and then ramping up for a response. So in the green shows an opportunity for controlling an outbreak. What we like to see through our efforts is a more rapid time frame where laboratory confirmation and even detection and reporting through surveillance activities occurs very early, which makes our response much quicker and we can be more nimble in how we respond to that. And therefore your, your green component or the component you can prevent cases or respond effectively, you can really clip these epi curves uh, very early. And through our global response activities, which has a large emphasis on laboratory quality and standardization, and communications uh, as a part of that has really been significant in helping us achieve these types of models in uh, several different outbreak scenarios. So I put this slide into a lot of my talks about lab capacity because when the public thinks about the CDC and, and what we do here, they think of a laboratory like this, but as, as Quentin and Dan have already talked about and, and shown some examples of, most of the laboratories where we're trying to do or implement these types of systems uh, are really less sophisticated. And so on the left is a, a traditional CDC makeshift laboratory where we do outbreak response or ecology studies in, in low-income countries. And on the right is a fairly sophisticated lab uh, within one of these countries where we support technical assistance for uh, a variety of di different diagnostic tools. Uh, so we have to be realistic about what the capabilities are for sustainable systems. Uh, but also understand that the public's perception of laboratory science may be different than what we really have to deal with. This schematic really shows um, an ev or the end point of evolution of laboratory science for integrated systems. And I show this for a couple of reasons. One, so that people really understand the complexity of lab operations and integrating lab, epi, and clinical interventions. Uh, and as, as uh, Dan and Quentin talked about, quite often we run laboratory tests or pathology uh, to dictate how a patient is treated. So it's not a one and done scenario. There may be monitoring, uh, there may be uh, testing for, for drug delivery systems, that sort of thing. And so this integrated system goes from the lab to uh, an IT or a management system for integrated results and electronic records so that we can mine that data and actually looking for patterns. Uh, this also facilitates uh, telepath or telemedicine 
uh, as Dan talked about, and we have a component of that for parasitic disease here at the CDC as well. And then for outbreak response for, for us, and one of the core features that we try to instill through the Global Health Security's agenda is the development of emergency operations centers. So these are crisis and outbreak management centers. They're not specifically for infectious disease, although here at CDC we use it quite often for that. They're also for environmental responses. Uh, in fact, our EOC is ramping up today for the, for the uh, hurricane response uh, uh, based on what we're seeing on the Weather Channel. Uh, so this system allows us to deploy staff to the Emergency Operations Center to support uh, uh, deployments, logistics of, of data information sharing, as well as uh, reagent shipment, epidemiology surveillance, lab quality, lab management support around pushing out uh, protocols for responses, and then trying to respond, uh, perform coordination of the response overall. So we work globally with partners. Uh, on how to coordinate our efforts uh, so that we're all working in the in the same direction. For pathology, you know, we, we use a lot of uh, our pathology group here at CDC, uh, a lot of their intellectual um, capacity to help us develop systems that, that make our laboratory work more efficient. And one example is a recent development of an algorithm uh, that's being developed and piloted for disease outbreaks uh, of unknown origin. And so uh, across CDC, the groups have met and, and subject matter experts and talked about this. And it turns out the best place to have the initial point of contact for these scenarios is our pathology group, because they're so used to dealing with different types of specimens, managing the quality of those specimens, uh, and, and assisting epidemiologists with determining the best course of action for laboratory testing. So just a few examples of, of response uh, or applications of lab diagnostics and pathology. Um, as, as most of you are aware, the West African Ebola outbreak from 2014 to 2016 uh, was truly a global response. Uh, and it, it required a lot of coordinated effort around diagnostics and lab support, including makeshift laboratories in country uh, by participants from all over the world, quite frankly. And in the midst of that, we also dealt with uh, Zika and the Americas. Uh, and pathology has played a tremendous role in understanding the virus's tropism and how it affects uh, neurological tissue. Uh, and we continue to uh, we continue to work in that area and try to understand more about that virus and how it's affected different populations. Um, then, then another aspect is potential threats. So how do we use lab science, including pathology, uh, for potential threats? So these would be exposures to, to, uh, to environmental threats or outbreak responses. This would include influenza, Ebola, uh, anthrax, other areas. And then looking at surveillance opportunities for evidence-based clinical studies, uh, such as the CHAMPS study out of uh, Emory University in collaboration with CDC and others that I'll talk briefly about. Uh, but in terms of threats, uh, I wanted to talk about a couple cases we've dealt with that really required uh, uh, pathology support and lab standardization. One was uh, the case of the lady in the iron coffin. And this was a young woman uh, whose body was unearthed in Queens, New York at a construction site. Uh, she had been buried in this iron casket, which mummified the body. And when the body was found, the, the Queens County coroner was concerned about the gross uh, anatomic presentation of what appeared to be smallpox. And so uh, I was called about that case. And with Dr. Chris Paddock and our pathology group, we went up to uh, New York and examined the body, uh, took specimens for rule out, and uh, within 24 hours determined whether or not there was a possibility of a viable virus. Uh, on the body, and, and fortunately there was not, but it did require a considerable amount of, of uh, engagement and expertise in pathology. The physical appearance on the body uh, and the panel, panels to the left, uh, the upper panel is a section on the, on the scalp, uh, and you can see the umbilicated lesions, uh, and you can get a sense of the, what they characterize as it feels like a BB under the skin. Uh, in this case. And then on the, the lower panel, you can actually see the umbilicated lesions on part of the back. Uh, 
of the body. And on the right is a, a arm of a patient around 1968 during the eradication campaign. Uh, now this body was, uh, this, this young woman passed away probably in the 1850s. Uh, so the, the, the quality of the lesions and the preservation was really astounding. Uh, but this is an example of, of how acutely these types of situations can come up and how we need this kind of expertise to uh, respond. And we did do pathology and it was very helpful in understanding the tissue. In this case, the, the skin tissue was not very well preserved, so it was difficult uh, to, to assess whether or not there was virus present. Uh, but it was, it was a, a very interesting case and the pathology and the quality of the lab systems was very vital in understanding uh, the threat as, as we dealt with it in real time. Another case of application of, of both lab science and clinical pathology is the CHAMP study, which is a model for pathology and uh, use of lab diagnostics. And so this is a study that was developed through Emory University to look at cause of death and, and neonatal mortality. And there's, I only show this graph or this picture to show you uh, the multiple steps involved in this study. Uh, which include mortality surveillance, specimen collection, uh, clinical data, and verbal autopsy. So there was a significant amount of pathology going into this, uh, and then microbiology, real-time PCR. And this is just to identify pathogens uh, that may be associated with mortality. Um, and then the local and central histopath analysis really would, would take it another step farther in trying to determine cause of death. In these children. This is an ongoing study. It's very exciting in terms of what it might reveal. We, we know why kids die globally, but quite often, um, you know, the, the use of presumptive diagnostics is used. We call it syndromic management. And so in low-income countries, quite often the cause of death might be uh, fever or malaria without any laboratory or pathologic diagnostics. This study really goes uh, the extra way to try to determine exactly what the cause of death in some of these children were, was. And uh, it also utilizes uh, a specimen assessment. And, and this graph, just, this picture just gives you an idea of what types of tissues were taken and what types of tests. Uh, and this included pathological analysis, uh, in some cases culture, and then TAC card analysis. Uh, which is a multiplex PCR-based test that identifies numerous agents uh, with one specimen. And we found this to be a real workhorse in terms of rule in or rule out diagnostics for complex cases. And quite often these samples uh, that are run on the TACMAN array cards are developed from a pathological assessment or examination. And so this goes to uh, what Quentin talked about with presumptive diagnostics trying to eliminate the need to do presumptive and actually get lab data which would dictate uh, our knowledge base of, of what's causing these problems. And, and I'll leave you with this, that uh, I'm a laboratorian by training. We focus a lot on lab systems and how to be more effective in translating technical work, uh, in our case, from the U.S. to some of these other countries. And it's really through gaining the trust of the local ministries of health and providing the type of training that's going to stick and supporting them when they need support. Uh, and as Pasteur said, you know, without laboratories, people of science are soldiers without arms. And I think that's as true today as it was uh, during his life. I appreciate your time. And uh, we are going to move to the question and answer session. And uh, thank you for your attention. Well, th thank you very much, um, Kevin and Dan, for those fabulous overview presentations from perspectives of uh, two institutions, ASCP and CDC, that are so intimately involved in uh, laboratory capacitation and diagnosis around the world. So please um, continue to send in your questions. We have quite a few that have come through already, and I'm going to group some together and uh, Go ahead and direct the questions if they specifically directed. Otherwise, um, Dan or Kevin or myself could answer them. So there's one question that comes through on what are the possible supports that can be provided 
in training for pathology in LMICs that are sustainable. And I guess the question is getting at, as well as is another one, the immense gap in capacitation. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, maybe Dan initially and then Kevin, what your thoughts are on, given the fact that it's going to take by some calculations, if we go at current rates, 400 years to fill that gap, what are the measures one might uh, think about in moving that along a little bit quicker in uh, training for pathologists and laboratory technologists? Thank, thank you, Quentin, and thanks for the audience member who asked that question. Um, I think there are a couple of important ways you can address that gap. Uh, the presentation I gave on telepathology is clearly a bridge. That's not sustainable because we ultimately want to have pathologists on the ground in every country and every laboratory because you need to do a lot of other things besides make diagnoses um, around the laboratory and, and having someone just to help with the diagnoses via telepathology isn't enough in the long run. So you can build a residency program in the country uh, where you're working. Rwanda has successfully done this. We did a calculation with the Minister of Health about how many pathologists would be needed in the country in the long term and came up with a number of between 40 and 50. Uh, and as of today, they have more than 30 um, with only five or six years ago starting a residency program. So when a country is fully committed to training their own people and uses external and internal resources to do that, you can actually quickly train a class, but what you have to realize is that once you get to that number of, say, 45 or 50 pathologists, you now need to open your doors to train pathologists from other countries that are going to go back to their own country. Um, because if you keep training pathologists, you're going to overburden the market, which is what's happened in South America, and you have, you know, pathologists sitting on the street corner selling Coca-Cola because there's just not enough jobs available for people. And so you really have to be smart about your capacity building and smart about how you, you know, you use your resources to do that. The other is, is telementoring. So as you're doing telepathology to make diagnoses, you can also do telementoring where those 15 pathologists, for example, that we connect people to are able to have conversations with the pathologists on the ground that are not related to patient care, that are on any topic. It could be helping them with learning more about histology or pathology or et cetera, et cetera, but it could also be on career development, leadership, et cetera. And, and so active telementoring outside of just telepathology can really increase your, your workforce and the quality of your people on the ground. And, and I think, you know, from my point of view, those are two ways that that you can absolutely create a sustainable workforce um, and do that. But on the flip side of that coin is you have to have government investment in salaries because once someone is highly specialized and trained as a pathologist, you know, you, you risk them leaving the country to go somewhere else and work for more salary. And so, you know, we can create training schemes, but we also have to have vested governments, invested public-private partnerships, and even private laboratory situations so that those pathologists can earn a living in the country where they're trained um, and will stay there. And so that, that's how I would answer that. So it's, it's, there's a, a question as well about whether one really needs to train at the level of a full pathologist. I mean, in Africa, we in clinical settings, we very effectively used um, um, what they variously call medical officers and people like that. Is there some intermediary we can reach between a fully trained medical pathologist and a technologist, but who's equally qualified to do that? Or would you think that's a dangerous move? No, and unfortunately, the answer to that question is no. Um, and I'm not saying that as a biased pathologist, because, you know, I, I, I fully believe that in my lifetime, we'll have a little black box that we can stick a needle in a patient's tumor and stick it in that box, and we'll forego the need for a pathologist and go straight to that treatment plan. I don't, I don't anticipate that that's not going to happen, but it's not going to happen tomorrow. But if you have a person standing in front of you with a lesion and you biopsy it, you've done a single test. You've made a, you've made a pathological you know, biopsy, and you process it. You look at it under the microscope. But when you look through that microscope, there are literally thousands of possible results. Um, just to give you an example, in Peru, uh, women who present with stage 4 breast cancer, in quotes, clinical stage 4 breast cancer, close quotes, uh, meaning they have a lumpy breast and they have positive lymph nodes, 
when you actually biopsy them, 20% of them have tuberculosis. So if you just, as Quentin was saying, go on clinical acumen, you would be wrong. But if your pathologist is only trained to, say, pick out breast cancer, uh, they're not going to understand how to diagnose tuberculosis or lymphoma or sarcoma of the breast. And, and remember that any organ of the body can have a tumor from any other part of the body, which can be a metastasis. And so your pathologist, unfortunately, needs a high level of skill, and it's not something you can skimp on. However, you can support a freshly trained pathologist through te telepathology and telementoring so that they don't need to know everything, but they can then learn, learn everything they need to know even while they're on the job practicing. So we may be able to shorten the training somewhat, but there's not really an intermediary between, um, between a fully-fledged pathologist and, for example, a medical technician. So, sorry, we've got, to, we've got a lot of questions, and we've got to, we have five minutes left, so I'm going to have to make some selections here. Um, now, a lot about that theme that, that, that Dan has just addressed, so I, can't, I won't reiterate those, but here's an interesting one. What do you think uh, the reason is for the less a visibility of the importance of laboratory services, despite the fact that many decisions of treatment are made by the lab, by lab results in the general health service. So I think we can add a little bit to that, and it's a question why pathology, why not more physicians are going into pathology, and why lab services are not getting quite the visibility that they kind of need. And then, Kevin, do you want to have a stab at that, or Dan, or either or any of us? Uh, I can I can speak briefly to that. I, I think uh, uh, it, it depends on where you're looking, but one of the things we found uh, in our global work from CDC, is it gets back to the sustainability piece, is uh, the value of the laboratory is not, uh, it's not a sprint. So it's, it's a long distance race uh, and the value of it is in sustainability. Uh, and when it's sporadic, uh, uh, you know the the trust or the value of it is diminished in the in the culture, and I, and I think Quentin has some slides related to that, the quality management piece and sustainability. So, uh, if if so, for example, with the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, the initial cases were managed through syndromic management, which means they were thought to be malaria early on. Uh, had you had a diagnosis early on and could quarantine properly you may have eliminated uh, or curtailed the epi curve in that outbreak very early. But since it wasn't available and people weren't used to using that, uh, I don't think it was uh, on the front of their minds. And so the sustainability for contemporary lab or pathology services uh, is quite expensive by these standards. Uh, and I think we have to do a better job of training people to understand the value of it in the long term as well as the short term. Okay, there's a question. Um, thanks, Kevin. A question, a lot of questions about um, uh, private sector helping, and I think, Dan, you mentioned the private sector being involved in, uh, I think, some of the equipment initiatives in the uh, cancer initiative, but also involvement of volunteers and Another question about WHO and Gates. I think there are a lot of people that want to come in and help. And let's try and bundle that into a single question. There seems to be a lot of potential help from private sector, from potential volunteers, and maybe organizations around the world. How would you think about coordinating all of that in a, in a logistically feasible and um, a sustainable manner? Thank you. That's an excellent question. And I, I think the way that I think about it is um, there are populations of people in the world and that and I apologize. You probably I'm in Chicago. You may be able to hear sirens. <laughs> Sorry for that. Um, there, there, I think about populations of people in economic groups and we think about the bottom billion of the pyramid and that bottom billion um, have no money for their health care, but they still need that health care. But that second and third billion above them have some income. They have some, uh, you know, some resources at their disposal. And as you move up to that fourth and fifth billion and up to the top billion, et cetera, there's more and more resources as you go up that tier. So in a public-private partnership lab or when you envision a, a private laboratory helping the public laboratory, there are pay schemes, insurance schemes. There are ways to you know, bundle resources and use them so that you can provide a certain percentage of patients with free care 
while other patients who have the means can pay for that care. And, and unfortunately, the U.S. does not have a good model for how to do that. But if you look at a given laboratory in Africa and you take their, their information in and you process it from a point of view of budgeting and thinking about that and, and having a significant no pay percentage, you realize very quickly that you can still make it work. Um, it's just not, um, it's not at the scale it is in the U.S. And, and I don't want to get into numbers, but for example, in Tanzania, in an economic model that a student worked on with me, um, we demonstrated that you could have up to 30 to 40 percent of the population not paying for their pathology services through this laboratory, and you'd only have to increase the current pricing for pathology from about $27 to about $36. Now, in the U.S., that same biopsy would cost several hundred dollars. So, so that there's, a, there's a different in economies of scale that you achieve in Africa, and you are able in LMICs, for example, to off-balance that and, and pay for that. But you have to think about it at the, at the individual population level and at the system level, but it can be done. And, and again, it has to be done because it's simply unethical to not treat patients who have cancer. All right. Um, we're right on the hour, and uh, there are a lot more questions, but um, I'm afraid we're going to, I'm getting a call that we need to end right now. So I really wanted to thank very much the, the speakers, my colleagues, Dr. Um, Karem and Dr. Uh, Milner, uh, for participating in this webinar hosted by CUGH. Um, I think an enormous number of really interesting questions have come up. I think we begin to appreciate how underappreciated pathology and diagnostics have been. Um, I think the slides will be available, or the webinar may be taped from what I understand. But I also do want to end by just reminding everyone that the CUGH, Consortium Universal Global Health Conference, uh, will be held next year in Chicago, um, the main conference between March 8th and 9th, um, and the satellite meetings the day before, which are free of charge. Strongly encourage you to attend that. It's a fabulous meeting with over 170 institutions involved, usually close to 2,000 people participating. And we will have a pathology presence there again, as we did last year, um, uh, inviting uh, candidates from Africa and the new, newly formed AfriHealth group as well for the African Forum for Research and Education in Health will also have a satellite. So that's March 7 to 10 in Chicago. And um, thank you once again. Uh, for, for this incredible session and for your participation. My apologies to those of you whose questions we didn't get to, but it shows there's a lot of questions that go unanswered and, uh, and probably scope for another session in a, a few months along these lines. Feel free to send in some more suggestions or feedback, but once again, I'm going to end this, the, the, the webinar and thank everybody for your uh, participation. <laughs>